There we are. Well, I think that it is half past ten, so shall we begin? And I'll begin with the notices, which uh, are relatively short. Uh, first of all, we hope that we've got everything ready and we welcome everyone who's going to take part and everyone who, <coughs> well, everyone indeed will take part and all those who will lead and which will, I hope, be an enjoyable time. <coughs> We've just had apologies from Jeff Cable. We also have apologies from John Williams, who has had at least eight funerals during this week. Oh, uh, yeah. It has overcome with uh, work. Uh, and from Martin Spain, who has been asked to lead a remembrance service in Senny Bridge and his role as an army chaplain. And also from Sarah Isles, who hopes to be here to join us at the latter part, but she has had to take her husband to attend a hospital appointment. Oh dear. So the, those are the uh, notices. And I think with that, I can ask Moira if she would give us a little welcome. And we welcome Moira back very much indeed mm -hmm. after her surgery. Thank you very much, Chris. I'm doing very well now, thanks. Well, good morning, everyone. Beautiful, morning. beautiful morning for our spring assembly. We generally have a reasonable day for it, but today the sun is gorgeous. It's nice to see people here. It would be better to see you in the flesh, but look forward to that in the autumn. We look forward to a very good meeting this morning as we welcome you, Janet, and we look forward to all you have to say. Good morning. God bless every one of you. And this is going to be a happy, happy service for us. Amen. Thank you very much indeed, Moira. And can I invite our president, Steve, to lead us in prayer? Shall we pray? Creator God, as we look now upon our sunshine and all that you send us, we pray, Lord, that you will be with us in this meeting. And Lord, as we remember on this day, the funeral of Prince Philip, we pray for the royal family, for unity, for the Queen's faith, for all the work that Prince Philip did in helping others. Mm. And yeah. Lord, we know that it's not the funeral they would have wanted, but Lord, in these difficult times, we thank you that they had the wisdom to have the right funeral, that they could show the people that they are with them. They are not separate from them. They are mourning and grieving like so many today. Mm. And Lord, yes, there may be more television coverage than many would anticipate. But in the end, Lord, it's still a family grieving. So just be with them now, as you were with us, as we wait for your word from Janet and from all those who will take part, that, Lord, we will be lifted up because, Lord, we need you in these dark days. And we pray that with the hymnist we can all say today, all my hope on God is founded. Mm -hmm. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Steve. And I'd ask Steve if he would continue by giving us our reading from the Bible. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. The reading is taken from Genesis chapter 8 and the first 19 verses. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased. 
Then the ark rested in the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, on the mountain of Arawat. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. Then he sent out a raven, which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. He also sent out from himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her feet, and she returned into the ark to him. The waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand, and he took her, and drew her into the ark to himself. And he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent the dove out from the ark. Then the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, a fresh plucked olive leaf was in the mouth, and no one knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So he waited yet another seven days, and sent out the dove, which did not return again to him any more. And it came to pass, in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, and indeed the surface of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife, and your sons, and your sons' wives with you. Bring out everything with you, every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on the earth, and be fruitful, and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife, and his son's wives with him. Every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, and whatever creeps on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. May the Lord add a blessing to his word. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much indeed, Steve, and a lovely reading. And even with a few sound effects, but just as Steve was mentioning the waters receding, someone poured a drink and one heard them receding at the same time. So uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, just before I introduce Janet, uh, could I say that uh, two apologies uh, slipped from my memory. Yvonne is not able to come with us today because there is a meeting in of the Finance Committee, and for the same reason, our Treasurer Sue can't be with us because she has to be at that Finance Committee. And so, uh, Janet is, of course, a very old friend, uh, although that could be taken in two ways, so I apologise if it's taken in the wrong way. Uh, she is ever youthful and ever enthusiastic, and so it is a great pleasure to welcome Janet and ask her if she would lead us with her thoughts. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. It's still rather odd to be here um, when we're gathered in so many different places, um, but it's a, a good thing to gather together. And I think we'll, we'll carry on in some ways, gathering electronically as well as face to face. Uh, so life is never quite going to be the same again. And that's what, I want to explore with you today um, uh, what is going to be different about our lives in the future. Some big things are going to look at uh, the way in which previous uh, major global events have changed life forever, but also some little things about our own lives as well. I do feel when you, you hear that passage from Genesis uh, at the end of the flood, um, so, um, so, meaningfully read for us just now uh, so that we got all the joy of the animals and the people coming out of the ark but before that it's very tentative isn't it um so uh, they leave it they they send out the first they first of all they look and then they send out the first of the birds 
and then they leave it seven days um, to see if anything happens and they send something else out. They leave it a little bit longer and even when the dove comes back with the, um, the branch in her beak and, and um, Noah puts out his hand and, and catches her and draws her back into the ark, they still <laughs> leave it a bit longer and I feel as though we're like that. Um, we've tried maybe going out to a shop that wasn't essential, but we leave it for a little time. Um, and maybe, maybe I don't know, we've even been and sat in a pub garden like I have, freezing cold, um, but, but just trying it out. And then we leave it a bit longer. And we're looking forward to that time when uh, God will say to us, you can take off the hatch cover now. Uh, mm -hmm. And we battened down the hatches in uh, March last year. And if we can start to unscrew the hatches and, and get the hatches off again and start to look out and see if the dry land is open, <laughs> then maybe step outside the ark. So I'm going to explore that now and exploring it in terms of where we are in the Christian year as well, um, that we've celebrated the resurrection but we're with the disciples still waiting to see what life, this new resurrection life will be like uh, to explore that together. And I'm going to share my screen now um, so that we can look together at some things. And I hope that ha happens and works um, from the beginning. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But if it does, it'll be lovely. There we are. Yes, look at that. Emerging from the tomb, post-resurrection communities. Um, can I check that everyone can see that? Uh, yeah. And you're okay. And um, yeah. if you've got, uh, you might have a little line of, of uh, heads by the side. If you want to get rid of those, you can do easily enough. Um, by hovering over them and, and making hide thumbnail video. Or if you want just me, I can't think why you would, you could show small active speaker, which I think is fabulous. Um, <laughs> and if you want, you can move me around the screen as you do that. <laughs> and I spend quite a lot of time fiddling around with the speakers in these uh, lectures, uh, moving them from place to place. But this is what we're talking about, emerging from the tomb uh, and post-resurrection communities. Jesus is alive, hallelujah. And that happens, that's true whether it's Easter or Pentecost or any time. Um, but today, perhaps more than ever, we can, uh, we can uh, imagine what it was like for those disciples um, to be, have seen Jesus come from the tomb, to have seen him ascended into heaven, but not yet to know, not to, yet to receive the Holy Spirit, uh, standing in in the rest of the world. And there, it, it, we're back to, to Noah and his family and the animals. I've looked at lots of these pictures and there are always giraffes and camels. I suppose they're <laughs> recognizable. <laughs> um, but I, I love the, the, the way the people are standing, um, all the people are standing around. And it was the one that looked most like standing on the threshold of a new world. Um, and they're standing there outside the ark. They've thrown up the hatches and they've come outside and they're standing on the threshold of the new world. So what's it like having been so surrounded by death for Noah and his family, having seen the whole of the, uh, the human race and the whole of the animal kingdom uh, destroyed, having been surrounded by so much death and destruction and then uh, to step out into that world. What is it like for the disciples having seen Jesus die so horribly on the cross and the ending of all their hopes and dreams and then uh, to stand on the threshold of a new world? That's what we're going to explore. We're going to look at it in, uh, with a number of different examples from earlier times. A 14th century pandemic, we'll just touch on briefly, um, then a civil war, fire and plague, 17th century, and then two 20th century wars, um, during which you'll be introduced to the new Constance Coltman book. And then we'll come to our own pandemic and think about what life uh, is like in the light of the big changes that have taken place in these other 
pandemics, fires, wars, plagues, and so on. The next picture, I have to warn you, is, is not very pleasant to look at. So we'll look at it briefly and, and pass over it. Um, but it's from a tombstone from the 14th century plague. Um, and then I'll move on from it to uh, a, an empty landscape. Um, this is a, a, a village that's been recreated in Wales. Uh, it's a, a village that's um, uh, set to uh, something like 1380, which is about uh, 20 to 40 years after the 14th century plague. The 14th century, 1300s, is uh, supposed to be the worst uh, century to be alive in Britain. Uh, because it was a time of plague after plague after plague. People, um, uh, in the end, two th one third of the population of Wales um, was devastated. It says to my irritation that the population of Wales was decimated. Uh, that is, a third of the population died. Decimated means one tenth of the population died. I hope you know that. Um, and it says, if you know anything at all about the English language and uh, Latin languages, um, and I don't know what decimated is in Welsh, but it, yeah, no doubt it has the same background to it, uh, but much, much, much worse than that. And this is a, a village that's been um, recreated. Um, there you've got the tithe barn and um, the swineherd's cottage. Um, so just ordinary um, uh, buildings. And what happened after the 14th century plagues was that life was never the same because such a large proportion of the population died um, that first of all, um, there was nobody to work the land. And that meant that there was terrible, desperate poverty as well. And the poorest of the population got poorer and poorer. But then after that, um, in, in England, certainly we had the Peasants' Revolt. Um, you've got an overturning of society, um, the failure of the feudal system, and uh, people moved out of Wales into England in large numbers. Um, but the people who remained on the land eventually rebuilt the, the world in which they lived. Um, they had... Uh, uh, that you, you had, could have access to very cheap land. And therefore those people who stayed in the countryside um, found that they could rebuild their lives and their lives became better after a long period of, of devastation. So we'll leave the 14th century behind and we're traveling to Bunyan Meeting, the church that I attend. Chris Stamp is the minister, um, a Welsh speaker himself. Uh, and we learn a few things from him. Uh, we learn a lot from him, but we learn a few words of Welsh from him as well. We're in Bunyan Meeting. We're in our museum, the Bunyan Museum. If you're ever this way, do drop in and have a look at the Bunyan Museum. And there is John Bunyan sitting uh, in the corner with a, with a pint uh, pitcher in his hand. And he's dressed in Civil War soldier's outfit because he was, in fact, a soldier in the Civil War before he was converted to Christianity. Um, he, he went along, as uh, many young men do, wanting to, to make his fortune. Um, and he signed up uh, in one of the recruitment drives. And he was posted to Newport Pagnell, um, which was right on the front line of the Civil War at that time. Um, and he doesn't seem to have seen much action, um, but uh, he did uh, encounter a lot of discipline and he encountered Christianity. He heard um, preaching, he would have had a copy of the Soldier's Bible. And it's no surprise, I think, that when he returned to Bedford um, and to his home, he went back to the tinker's trade, um, but his heart had been changed. And so he, um, he had this amazing, wonderful conversion. And of course, then went on to write, um, here there are two of his uh, writings here, The Holy War, uh, which seems to have been based quite a lot on his experience as a soldier, but also the famous book, The Pilgrim's Progress, of which we have copies in um, almost every language in the world at the time uh, that the, uh, of those next few centuries. And The Pilgrim's Progress went out into the world as a, as a, a great missionary um, uh, 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 
tool for, of mission. Um, Bunyan, John Bunyan was not uh, a, a wealthy man. He was not uh, uh, very well educated. Um, and in fact, Pilgrim's Progress and the other books nearly didn't make it into publication because uh, the only people who were interested in publishing at that time uh, were publishing uh, um, very well-read people. The only people who had access um, to being able to put out their, their uh, publications um, were people who um, were rich and who were well-educated. Um, but at that time, um, the printing presses were rolling uh, and uh, lots and lots of new material was being published. And so Pilgrim's Progress and uh, John Bunyan's writings got caught up in that. And of course, he lived through uh, not only the, the Civil War, but also the restoration of the monarchy and the, the plagues and fires that, that, that um, su subsequently swept the land or swept London and swept the land. Um, we don't know much about his experiences at that time, but we do know um, that the Civil War, a higher proportion of the population was killed than in the First World War. And nearly every family, every community was touched by that war. And so um, nearly every uh, community, every family would have known people who had died. I can remember when that started to happen for COVID. It was around about November Christmas time when it stopped being something that happened to other people and started being something that actually touched everybody's life. And that was the point I think at which it became something very real to everybody. There were people of course whose lives were touched before that, but it, became, it reached that standing like the First World War, um, like the Civil War that you, everybody's life was touched. Um, and again, life was never quite the same again, um, because with the, uh, the spread of, of uh, printing, with the fact that nonconformists and dissenters were not allowed to attend uh, the great universities, weren't allowed to take part in uh, civic life, weren't allowed to um, take part after the restoration of the monarchy in parliament or local government, they started to teach in different ways and they started to, to explore the world around them. And so that sparks off really um, the spread of learning, the spread of scientific learning um, into many, many different communities. And so it's no longer that learning was uh, confined to a very few people who were able to go to Oxford and Cambridge and places like that, but people began to have access to learning and so life was never the same again. Now, um, this is a, it could be um, a, a, a commercial break, but it's actually to look at another person um, in the light of a war. Constance Coltman um, and the book, uh, her book has just been published, edited by, oh, look who that was. Um, but it's not the yeah, editor, it's the, <laughs> the least important person here. Um, because, um, uh, to uh, celebrate her, the centenary of her ordination, we had a, um, a conference of global pioneers um, and we had a Thanksgiving service um, and uh, um, uh, talks and lectures. Uh, the congregational lecture was given by Fleur Houston, um, who's a URC minister. And you'll see as we go on through these next few slides that uh, you'll recognize many of the people who were involved. Um, she uh, was uh, uh, the first woman to be ordained in a Trinitarian church in these islands. Now that's very carefully said because there are lots of other um, women who were ordained or became church leaders around the same time. In America, of course, they'd had lots of uh, women ordained by then. The Salvation Army, of course, had women leaders. Um, but she was the first on the 17th of September, uh, 1917. Right, so she was ordained in the middle of the First World War. And her first church was um, a, a, a small East End mission in the East End of London. And so at the time when there was aerial bombardment at that time, even in the First World War, but of course uh, she was caring for a church in which many of the people 
um, the, the husbands and the brothers and the sons and the fathers would have been going off to war and not coming home. So she was ministering to a congregation, um, desperately poor people um, suffering in the middle of the First World War. We had a, a conference and various other things um, to honour the centenary of her ordination. You'll recognise Yvonne there, um, but it was a global conference. And so Min He um, from, I think, Taiwan is next to her. Um, and then next to her, to her left, is uh, Patricia, who is from um, Jamaica. And next to her is Karen, who is from uh, London. She's a URC minister um, and she led the service. She's a URC non-stipendiary minister. Um, and I love that picture of Karen uh, leading the service. This is the service of Thanksgiving, which was held in the American church in, uh, in Tottenham Court Road. Uh, Suzanne is there. Hi, Suzanne. Um, all the way through the service, um, Suzanne was leading us on a pathway, a journey through MIME. And Litha Nevard, who is a URC minister, um, was taking part in the MIME just here. And the woman with her back to us sitting in the front row, you may recognise that's uh, Francis Brennan, who was with the Council for World Mission for a long time and is now the Deputy General Secretary for Mission of the United Reformed Church. Um, Susan Derber uh, was the preacher. Um, she was the, well, is the widow of Michael Derber, who was the first um, training officer for the Congregational Federation. Um, but Susan has been since then the principal of Westminster College in Cambridge and is now serving in congregation in a, in a UN National Reform Church again. Um, and that was the communion. Um, I'm still wearing the T-shirt, or not still, I'm wearing it again for this occasion. Uh, and we share together in communion, good congregationalists we are, by invitation of the congregation of the American church and their minister. Um, so we didn't break any congregational rules. We were at the, uh, invited and hosted by a, a, another congregation. But we shared in, in communion and that was lovely. I think I was singing just there, um, but uh, that's not an unusual expression on my face. And then... <laughs> Again, you may recognise one or two people here. Martin Spain is there. Um, and uh, they were raving, waving ribbons. And on the ribbons, we had written the names of pioneers, uh, women pioneers who were known to us. And the woman in the uh, uh, blue jacket in the front um, is the minister of the American church. You might know Geoffrey Roper, who's just behind Martin Spain. Um, Ruth uh, Brain is there in the background. Um, and the various other people you might know. Sheila Brain, sorry, I beg your pardon. Ruth Clark was there as well. And so it was a great occasion. Um, and the book has some wonderful endorsements. I've just, uh, one of them here is from Kathy Galloway. I was thrilled to bits when she um, wrote wonderful words. When a door long barred finally begins to open, an initial few and then a multitude rush through it rejoicing. The first one to slip through it quietly is easy to interlook, overlook. And that, of course, was Constance Coltman. This book is a necessary account of present day dissenters across the world. The witness of these women gives ground for hope. And that's where you can buy a copy of the book if you want one. Um, and we'll also send out, I hope, um, there's a, a flyer going out. Um, there's a, a, the launch of the book will take place on May the 18th by Zoom. So everyone can come to that. But you have to bring your own wine and nibbles. <laughs> And so, uh, but the thing is that here, um, in the in 1917, in the First World War, again, death touched everyone. This is a time like the time in the Ark, like the great plagues of the 14th century. Everybody had been touched by death, um, and they were again entering in a world into a world where nothing was really ever the same again. And one of the big changes that took place at the end of the second, the First World War um, was that although uh, they, went, they went back into their homes, um, many women um, had been very much involved in, uh, in uh, uh, working outside the home. There was a hospital in London that was run entirely by women, women doctors and women nurses. The uh, campaign for suffrage, women's suffrage, had been put on hold um, during the war so that the women could put their hearts into the service of other people. And of course, um, the first wave of women's 
um, suffrage did take place shortly after that. So there are big changes taking place. And I want to uh, end this part uh, with a look at the first, the Second World War. Um, and this is the world into which I was born. Um, and I would guess many, for many of the rest of us in this uh, um, uh, assembly together, um, this is starting to be the world that we know now. Um, there were refugees all over Europe. And although that says the World Council of Churches Refugee Service, it was actually founded by Christian Aid. Christian Aid was founded in 1945, um, straight at the end of the war. And they were founded as a, a Christian aid service, particularly for refugees. Um, and I knew many, many children uh, in my school as I was growing up who were children of refugees or um, children from the kinder transport. Um, and so we would have a look at, at, at Christian aid uh, because the world again was very different. And the big change that took place in the world after the Second World War um, was um, that the world itself wasn't the same. Um, we'd been used to having an empire um, and colonies and all of those things. And a lot of people were quite shocked with the way the world changed, but it couldn't stay the same. And so we began to see a world in which um, uh, countries that have been colonized um, or part of different empires, particularly the British Empire, um, gained their own independence. And uh, the, um, we began to be in a world where there was much more equality. There was a, a greater sense of, of what justice at least could look like, what a world could look like um, if people were treated equally and fairly across the world. It hasn't happened, of course. It's still a, a, a dream and a hope, but it is beginning to happen. And uh, agencies like Christian Aid and eventually agencies like Tear Fund, um, and I'll come on to Council for World Mission in a moment, um, be began to put a Christian voice into this, to see what it would be like, uh, um, what the scriptures said about the world in which we lived. And so cancel the debt, drop the debt was one of the campaigns that I was very much involved in. And I went and was noisy in Birmingham. Um, and then here again, Christian Aid is now moving onwards. And they're like many organizations trying to ensure that the vaccination rollout for COVID is not confined to those who live in rich nations or are among the rich that live in rich nations. And so we're trying to push forwards to see what the world could be like and here's a Council for World Mission. These are just screenshots. Um, and so here's a screenshot I've, I've um, uh, highlighted, mission support, hearing God's cry. And Council for World Mission, again, was among the first of the organizations, mission organizations, and to adopt a, mission, a pattern of partnership so that it was no longer um, the people in London uh, giving out grants to everybody in the rest of the world. Um, but a mission council together so that, that everybody had a part, it played a part in um, uh, deciding who could get grants, uh, the sharing of resources, uh, hearing each other's stories. And now, of course, it's one of the first of the mission bodies um, to uh, move its uh, headquarters from London into, in our case, um, Singapore. So this is the world we're moving into now. It's the world that has been changed by plagues and wars and fires and more plagues and more wars through the years. But what seems to happen is that unexpected changes take place. I don't think people could have understood the big changes that took, would take place after each of those things that we've been thinking about. And in each of the, the, the 17th century, certainly in the 20th century ones, um, a Christian voice has been there. And sometimes Christians have been resisting. We don't want this. We don't like this new world. But sometimes Christians have been part of it. And I think um, we can celebrate when Christians have been part of it. So what's the world um, we're moving into now? This is something from uh, Facebook this morning. Uh, I haven't put the person's name there. Some of you will know who it is, but I'm being very careful not to endanger um, our friends in Myanmar. 
but this came onto Facebook this moment. Uh, someone who's been keeping us in touch. Myanmar is going to be a big civil war. Lord, give us your healing. We don't want to see more killings and more wars. And he writes <coughs> from uh, Myanmar, we are now so tired. They're tired of the killing, tired um, of uh, when they had so much hope in Myanmar. I was there uh, the October before last uh, when things are beginning to open up. And I've been there during the military rule uh, when things were very difficult. But they really thought things were going to be different. What are the changes going to be uh, that uh, we hope to see in these coming years? That think of the big changes of the past. What is tapping on our door at the moment um, that uh, might um, change the world into which we are, we are moving now? Um, I, we started with a reading from the book of Genesis and that picture, that image of um, Noah and his family and the animals standing in this new world. What was this going to be like? We've had people moving out after plagues and after wars, moving out after a war is finished. What's it going to be like? What was it going to be like? We've seen huge social changes, global changes, things changing for the better in many ways, uh, uh, new equality, new justice, uh, new hope for people. Let's take you back to um, the, uh, the disciples um, standing uh, after Jesus had risen on the threshold of a new world. And I'm going to read a word that's often been taken as a, a commissioning for mission to go out into the world. But I'm going to ask a different kind of question after this. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, although some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all peoples everywhere, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you to the end of the age. So in a moment, we're going to break into groups. And these are the questions that I hope we're going to look at. How will the world change after the pandemic? Uh, I would like you to stay with that for a moment and think about um, what big changes are knocking on the door. Um, what are the movements that are gathering, gathering pace at the moment? I'm talking now about big movements, national, um, global movements. What are the new justices, the new changes that, uh, that need to take place in, the, in our world? Secondly, what teachings of Jesus? Jesus said, teach them to observe everything that I've commanded you. What particular teachings of Jesus do we, the nations, need to hear? I'm not saying what message now are we going to take out? We are part of the nations. What do we need to hear? Teachings of Jesus. The Drop the Debt campaign looked at the teachings of the Bible about debt. What do we need to hear uh, from the words of Jesus himself about the, 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 the world in which we're going out now? And then, uh, lastly, you can come to our own places, our own churches. Um, have, in, with all that in mind, how do we show God's love in our own communities? And now um, we're finishing this part at, at 11.10 and we go into our breakout discussions um, for uh, till 11.25. And I'm hoping someone else is ready to put us into those breakout discussions. That's Matthew. Sorry, I just wasn't told we were breaking out, so I'm not ready to break out. Um, ah, well, it, it said... Bear with me. 11.10, we're a minute early. I'm yeah. sorry about that. Thank you, pardon. <laughs> and we're breaking out till 11.25, and we've got our three questions. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Matthew. I put it down in the agenda as group discussions. Uh, yeah. I've taken to mean breaking out, sorry.
You've got five minutes of question. Yes, currently it's not giving me any facility to break out into your oh, room. Well, we could stay so here. I'm sorry, you're, you're not going there. <laughs> okay, right. Let's let's do it uh, as we are here. Um, if you want to, people want to unmute themselves. Uh, if you uh, and uh, do feel free to speak. Let me go back to the first of those questions then, and I just wonder if you have a feel for um, the the big changes that are knocking on our doorstep. What are people ho hoping will change? Um, as we go into this world uh, post the pandemic. Well, I think you were right, Janet, when you said that um, we'll be, we, the church anyway, and the world, yes, will be using uh, the electronic means of communication much, much more than ever before. That's so how do, yes, I, I, that's right. Yeah. I wonder how people feel about that. Is, is this a world that you feel comfortable in with, with electronic communication? <laughs> I think it's a bonus because if for whatever reason you can't get to a meeting and we can offer it on Zoom, you are still participating and part of what's going on, whether it's fellowship in church or a training session or just catching up with somebody. So it's a, it, there are some good things to this, uh, the, this yes. opening up of communication. Yeah. And there's also some bad things as well. Um, I think I, I, I'm very keen on technology and I use it an awful lot, but I want to know who owns it. Ah, yes. And yeah. who controls it. And the, we've got huge giants like Amazon um, who are part of this, um, you know, online internet world that don't, because because they're global, they don't pay t taxes in in, uh, in nations because, you know, finances are set up on a, in a, a national basis. And I think there's something about justice there, a sort of fair taxation for these huge global online giants. Um, that maybe we need to, to grapple with. And we can only do that actually on an international basis too. I found um, from a positive point of view, doing the, the online services, how many friends of mine that I never would have imagined would ever step foot through the church door, have yeah. been prepared to listen to a whole video and, you know, uh, and actually try and find out a little more about it. And so I suppose it's something that's been there, and like Suzanne, I kind of you know used to technology, but I've totally avoided it from the from, for use in church, uh, and so you know it's opened up doors in that way. Um, but again, there's there's negatives to that, and and maybe some people would be sort of happier just sat at home and never come into fellowship, you know. And there's something about being together as a people in person. I think we're all missing that at the moment, aren't we? But you know, there's some exciting stuff. I think, in some ways, God uh, has given me a kick up the backside and said, "There's this wonderful tool that you're not using to glorify Jesus." You know, and so um, I'm thankful for that kick, and uh, hopefully, we'll be able to do a mixture of different things to to bring God to people. So I think it's important. Sorry, sorry, Janet, you go ahead. No, go ahead. Right, what I was going to say, I think it's important. It is very important to use these things for communications. It's important to recognise that the devil knows how to use them very well himself oh, as well. <laughs> Thus, for instance, I was told of a young man in Hufford West, moderately intelligent, who is convinced that Barack Obama is a hologram uh, <laughs> put about by wicked left-wing uh, sources. So <laughs> one has these sort of things, and one needs, in a way, to try to counter the really idiotic but extremely malignant things that are put about by uh, these uh, huge technological uh, innovations. And the other thing, I think you spoke of how the world will change and we need to put enormous pressure on any politician we know, I think, to bear in mind that this is a time for love and cooperation in the world. So, for instance, when I was given my first and so far only anti-COVID injection, 
I said to the nurse, I really would rather have Sputnik V than AstraZeneca, which is true, because I think the Russians have actually, it sounds as though they have developed a very good uh, vaccine. But the point is, there is already competition between Sputnik V and the Chinese one and mm. the various Western ones in Africa and Asia and some of the poorer countries. And we need, and President Biden has said he wants to talk to President Putin. I think he's done the wrong thing in setting about with uh, sanctions, but that's uh, another matter. But if this is so, we need to put pressure on all politicians actually to cooperate in something that is of benefit, not only to the people who will receive injections in, say, Nigeria or Botswana, but also that will bring benefit to the whole world, because if you're to fight this thing, you've got to do it together. So I think that is an important thing, that we try to teach people to cooperate, and also maybe, um, sorry, I'm talking a lot, but it's something, I've been in correspondence with my local MP recently about sanctions on Syria, where I sent to him a report that I thought quite heartrending that came to us quite recently from Aleppo, of what sanctions are doing to the people of Syria. And it, these things seem to me like a bad teacher who catches a child who has misbehaved, and rather than punishing that one child, puts the whole class in detention in the hope that all the other pupils will then punish the yeah. child who has been naughty. And that seems to be what sanctions are. And you need to deal, you, however much you dislike and find someone else distasteful, until you have applied what Jesus did and talked to the people, you can't get anywhere. Sorry, sermon ended. No, that's good, <laughs> because those are big global things, aren't they? Could we find a different way of handling international relationships? And can the churches, is there a Christian voice that could be put into that, into things like Black Lives Matter, um, mm -hmm. environmental issues and that sort of thing? Um, and international relationships, as, as Chris has been saying. What, what are, sorry, uh, uh, sorry. Sorry, one, one thing that Chris mentioned there, which is, I think, is, is a real danger that we're headed into, is the misinformation side mm. of things, that it, it's spread so quickly and easily now, and, and someone just reads something online from mm. anyone, they've never heard of them before. And, uh, you know, the vaccine is one of them, I suppose. If I had anything, I'd go to the doctor, and if he advised me to have this medication or to have this operation, I would just say yes. But, you know, uh, we avoid that when we hear these people on YouTube talking about vaccines, uh, you know, having little things, chips in them, uh, you know, to know what you're doing when I'm, when I'm having my talks and that type of thing. But it's, it's so much misinformation. Now, the Christian voice then should be talking about truth. Uh, sadly, lots of Christians get dragged into that misinformation and inadvertently share the misinformation. And, you know, there's somebody in our church I had to speak to for quite some time who watched a video um, that was put by a pastor in America that was, was just full of misinformation and, and mistruths, you know. And so the Christian voice, we should be standing up for the truth uh, and, and making sure that we are really checking things out before we kind of share them on, I think something new for us to deal with if we're, if we're talking about the effect that christians can have in high positions i don't know how many of you have had the chance to read the story of kamala harris you know the vice president yeah. of the united states uh, i'm in the middle of it and it's one of the most moving books i think i've ever read as to how somebody from an appallingly poor background I won't go into it all now, but it is an inspiration. And I think we will all enjoy it very much. But one thing I wanted to bring up is I think a huge difference from the pandemic has been the way all of us, regardless of our age, have all had much more time to stop and think and be still. Mm. And it's one of the things when sometimes we're out on the streets with the street pastors and some of the kids come and say you know we're just so exhausted we're doing this we're doing this we're doing this we never have time to stop and think and the street pastors are going out again at the beginning of may and it's going to be fascinating to 
to see how it has affected so many. A lot of people we know will be in a lot of trouble because of loss of jobs, this sort of thing. But there is also such a deep need in, to have this time of peace and quiet and being aware of the beauty all around you. And then you can, we try and say to them, stop and just think um, about what God is doing. And try to, one person had this wonderful idea of saying, imagine you're sitting by a lovely fire in the window perhaps, and you don't do anything, you just sit and you feel that warmth just filling you. And that's what prayer to God is all about. You don't say anything. You just sit quietly and feel his presence filling you. And we found so often we get come back from that now. Uh, and to me, one of the huge advantages of all of this over the last months has been this feeling of quietness and stillness. And we must, must, must put that across as a wonderful opportunity to be aware of the Lord. Thank you. So we've had truth speaking, that's very important. Um, there's a, a sense of stillness. Um, there's a, a, a different vision of what the world could be in international relationships. Um, not this endless competition. Um, there's uh, uh, wanting to call to account the owners of the uh, of, of means of communication. Uh, that's very much like what was happening um, certainly in the 19th century when the big American publishers got going. Um, Fanny Crosby, uh, who wrote... Um, uh, Oh, I wrote this, the name of my book. This is our story. This is our, this is my story. This is my song. Yes. And, and about 8,000 other things uh, died in penury because although she'd written all those hymns, the money went into the pockets of the publishers. Um, so it's the same sort of thing. Um, in the last couple of minutes then, what could we be doing um, as, as Christians local churches, members of, of larger organisations, what could we be doing to, to, to bring the Christian voice into this, the teachings of Jesus into this? I was thinking about your teachings of Jesus and I actually kind of went a bit sideways. Um, I was thinking about the, the healing of the demoniac. Um, and there's lots of readings of what's going on there, but there's obviously some kind of mental health crisis. And the fact that um, it, it cost a herd of pigs in order for that man to be healed, which would have presumably cost the community a great deal of money for those pigs to go over the cliff. I do think we need to think locally and nationally about the cost of health care. Um, and, men and particularly mental health care. How much are we going to invest in in helping people through? Uh, and are we really willing to pay the cost of a herd of pigs or our equivalent for that? No. So yeah, help, helping people with um, through mental health issues after this, I think is going to be a biggie. Particularly because there, people have been uh, terribly stressed by the situation um, of, of isolation and, and bereavement and so on. Um, but there's always been a lack of um, care for people with mental health issues. So it's, it's br brought some things like that into to tighter focus. But I think what's made it worse really is that so many people still are terrified to go out. You know, yeah. they feel that the propaganda on this has been, I suppose, effective, but it's made many old people, well, young people too, feel that they can't go anywhere for the threat of death. They won't get near you, they won't talk to you, so, and that still persists, even though there is a hope with the vaccination, 
there's still this persistence of this, we won't go out because we don't want to take the chance. You know, my hus husband is ill already. I don't want to take the germs home to him. That's somewhere we can reach out to them. Mm. Yes. And these are people who don't have Zoom, who can't work with a computer, who have no concept of it. We need to reach to them somehow, mm. locally, people we know. Yeah. This is maybe this is something churches could be doing in their own communities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my my mum's church in Nottingham closed, unfortunately. It's one of those that didn't survive. Uh, so she immediately joined the church in Newark, which is about 50 miles away, but she they meet by Zoom. So she went and joined and, and joined their Bible studies and everything and is helping to set up a phone um, mission to people in Newark. Uh, from Nottingham, so uh, they, that there's sort of everything working together. <laughs> um, but they're, they're, they've got a phone. They've got Samaritans helping them um, to set up a phone number that uh, they can reach out to people. No, Mike, I completely understand that. I mean, we I've started doing a coffee afternoon in the Manse Garden. People can book in just less than six people, uh, and I've given them all the guidelines of how you know the coffee will be served and cake and everything else and it's just a soft re-entry yeah I think maybe what we can offer as churches is some little soft re-entry places and to let people know it's okay to be afraid it's not mm. there's nothing wrong with being afraid but we can help people to uh to face the fears and and i mean sometimes it's right to, <laughs> yes. well, we can help, help them to rationalize the fears and understand that yeah the fear is not well grounded we need to bring this part of the day to a close. So um, there's just a few minutes now for, uh, I'd like to pray for us if that's okay. Um, and then there'll be a short, what is billed as a comfort break. Um, but uh, let, 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 us, <laughs> let us pray, first of all, let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that you have been with your people through fire and famine and flood and um, plague and war um, and, the human race and various parts of it have faced uh, terrible circumstances before and you have been there. Um, we pray now that you will be with us in our generation, um, that we may hear what you have to say to us um, as the nations, as the churches, and that you will give us um, the, the wisdom um, to build a, a world that is the next stage a bit better. Um, that the nations may learn to work together in different ways. We pray for the people of Myanmar, Syria, and many other places. And we pray for our own selves and our own churches, our own communities, um, that we may be able to um, live together and work together, speak truth together, counter lies together, and be still together in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So if, if you haven't got your little glass of wine and your piece of bread for communion, now's the time to go and fetch it. And if any part of you needs emptying, now's the time to do it. Ten minutes. Back and forth. <laughs> How long have we got, Janet? Ten minutes, I think it's right. I'm just looking at the thing. Back at 11.40. Is that right, Chris? There, yeah, that's right. Okay. And, and incidentally, Janet, I uh, thank you for the discussion. I think as always, God worked things right. Yes, in stopping absolutely. us get the breakout room. I think you did the right thing. Thank, Thank you. you. Me too.
Very good. It is time. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we are there, and I can see that Jessup has joined us, and we would ask if Jessup would begin our second session by leading us in prayer. Uh, is this for uh, communion, is it? Yes, before communion, heading ready for communion. Okay, well, thank you. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we recall the death of your son, Jesus Christ, and we proclaim his resurrection and his ascension, and we look with expectation for his coming as the Lord of all nations. We have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the spirit. Now bring you this gift. Send the Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and wine that we who eat and drink at this holy table may share the life of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Pour out your spirit upon the whole earth and bring in your new creation and gather your churches together from the end of the earth into your kingdom, where peace and justice are revealed, that we, with all your people of every language, race, and nation, may share the banquet you have promised. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, all honor and glory are yours forever. As we just continue to have this meeting, Lord, be with us, and bless each one of us, and the churches belong to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Jessup. And what a lovely background you've got there, too. So thank you for that. And we head towards communion with thoughts on the communion. And... I would ask Matthew, could you put up, please, the pictures that I sent you? This picture is of a church by the Sea of Galilee. It's called the Church of St. Peter's Primacy and is in the very place where something special happened. The thing that happened was after the resurrection of our Lord Jesus and Seven of the disciples had gone out fishing. Some of them were professional fishermen. Peter, who had suggested the trip. But not all of them were. We know that Thomas and Nathaniel were there. Neither of them were fishermen. If Nathaniel was, probably his friend Philip was. Another non-fisherman. All of these people were there in what really was just a quiet, relaxing pleasure trip. They didn't catch any fish, but probably they hadn't been trying very hard. It was a time of contemplation, of relaxation and of happiness, really, because they knew that Jesus was alive again. But they weren't really very sure what he wanted them to do or where they were to go. So they were there fishing. And as they came in, someone called to them and brought them to this place. And they found it was Jesus. And there they came together and shared a meal, eating with Jesus in a very special breakfast. They would have come back and no doubt would have had breakfast. But what made it different was the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. He filled that breakfast with meaning. They didn't use bread and wine. They used the fish that they had caught. But it was a special time a communion, for it was a sharing with Jesus. About 30 years ago, I led a 
pilgrimage, I don't know as a pilgrimage, a holiday more, from members of our, my church here in Tabernacle, in Halford West, to the Holy Land. And we came to this place. Now, outside this church, if we could change a picture, Matthew, I'd be grateful. Out outside this church, there is a little stone table, and there are little stones round it. Could we change again? Wrong way. <laughs> Never mind. Down one, two. Next one down. And there, oh, he's gone. <laughs> Never mind, there are the, these stones, and these stones are meant to be the stones on which the disciples sat when the meal was being held. And I asked the guide if we could perhaps hold a communion service here, using the table, sitting on the stones, and on some benches that were put round the table. And we came there, a very popular tourist destination. And we were greatly blessed, for no one came to disturb us at all as we celebrated communion. And in that service, I asked the driver of our little coach if he would like to join us, for I knew that he was a Christian Arab. And he said, yes, he would like to receive the communion with us. And I asked the guide, who was a Jew, if he would play his flute, for we knew that he played the flute whilst I was taking the communion round, which he said he would do. And as the communion went round, one of the people on the trip took it. He was the then mayor of Pembroke. And he said he had never before received communion. It was an opening of his heart to the Lord Jesus. And as I came to the end of the row and offered it to the Arab driver, sitting next to him was the Jewish guide. And he said, may I receive it too? An Arab and Jew sat together receiving the love of Christ. It was a wonderful moment. It could have just been a tourist experience, but the Lord Jesus was there. And that made all the difference. Jesus was present. And so the communion became not just a nibbling of flat bread and a sipping of wine, but became living in the presence and taking the presence of Jesus into our lives. Communion is much, much more than a symbol. It is this living with Jesus. I remember. I used to take communion to an elderly lady who was housebound. It was always a little bit of a problem because she kept her house at sweltering heat, as so many very thin elderly ladies do. And always seeing me, she feared that I might be cold and turned the gas fire up which had the awful effect of making me want to go to sleep. But we received the communion together. And being of the old school, dear old thing, had beside her her hat. And when we came to take the communion, she always put her hat on as a sign of respect to the Lord who was going to visit her. She had had a terribly hard life and had watched both her sons die before her. But her absolutely iron faith 
never wavered for one minute. And just the two of us, together by that sweltering gas fire, were enveloped in the love of Christ as the communion was shared. There are different things that move different people. Some people are deeply moved by music, some by literature or poetry, by paintings and visual arts, which tend to be more my scene, possibly Suzanne's too. All and I think this is the biggest thing by nature, in different ways, by seascape or landscape, by great open vistas, by woodlands, by mountains. But sometimes I have walked in the mountains and have felt totally alone, maybe, the bleating of sheep in the distance, the odd bird in the sky. And then I've shared in the whole of creation and have known that God is there and that Jesus is with me. And this too is a form of communion as we feel the presence of the Lord. And that is what we seek. We seek a communion, not a selfish one alone, but as we come together around the table, we seek the presence of Jesus and the leadership of Jesus and the prompting of Jesus. This is what communion is. It is a ceremony, yes but a ceremony and a commemoration to bring us together in the name and the love of Jesus, to be with him, to feel his presence, and to know that he is God. Now, unscheduled, uh, in our programme, but I'm sure, I hope it won't cause Matthew any problems, it is a delight to welcome Suzanne with us as well. I wasn't sure that she should come, but she is with us. So I'd like to hand over to her for five minutes. Oh, gosh, Chris, I'm not sure I can follow that. And um, I certainly don't need the five minutes. Well, for two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Chris asked if I had any um, stories uh, about communion and just very two very briefly. The first is um, for the past seven months or so, I've been volunteering as an honorary chaplain in the uh, teaching hospitals in Sheffield. And as you know, there's been very few visitors allowed in to hospitals over the pandemic. Mm. And so often the chaplain is the only non-medical person <coughs> that someone may see. And so the visits are incredibly precious to people. Uh, and communion is part of that. It's often following a, an Anglican service, but uh, I, I must admit, I kind of free church it up, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and, a, and a couple of things that, that I change. One is that because, as Janet was saying about the American church, I'm very mindful that people are part, often part of church communities that request communion, uh, and that I'm not a priest, I'm a minister. Uh, and so we, we talk about the person's church a lot beforehand. Uh, and I will always include in the prayers the person's local church community. So it feels like it's aligning with that local church community rather than something that's dispensed by uh, a chaplain. Uh, and that's very meaningful. And people have have lamented and mourned the loss of their church communities and meeting in person. And often very much cherish those that have made contact through the phone or through um, Facebook Live or uh, Zoom chats and, and things like that. And then the second is um, 
the, the second thing I do is I always take communion with the person, uh, which is quite different from my colleagues. Um, and that's, that's very special. It becomes much more of a sharing with Jesus, I think, both of us together. Uh, and staff sometimes will stop and sit and be quiet and, and, and join in. Um, and you're, you're creating this um, different time amongst hospital time, if that makes any kind of sense. Um, sort of Kairos time, um, kingdom time amongst the, the, the noises and the whirls, the whirling busyness of a, of a hospital ward. Um, the second experience of communion that means a lot to me, I think Janet might remember as well. We went to a worship conference in the south of France. I know, <laughs> some people get all the jollies, don't they? <laughs> uh, and this was quite some time ago. Uh, and it was, a, uh, it was, we were there with CWM, but it was a, a group of European mission organisations. And the French Protestants, uh, remembering Time, a time when many of them were um, interred for conscience sake in during the occupation of France in the Second World War because they'd hidden Jews, because of uh, standing against the regime uh, and all sorts of things. They had led communion uh, in a prison camp um, without bread and wine. They had imagined those symbols. So it very much was the presence of Jesus because it couldn't even be on that kind of physical symbolic level. Uh, and they remembered that and invited us to share in a communion without bread and wine. And it was incredibly powerful. Um, something about solidarity with the suffering and also solidarity with the suffering of Christ as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, for bringing those those memories to mind. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Suzanne. And we are coming near to 12 o'clock. I shall apologise immediately because I'm not quite near to my grandfather clock, which will chime <laughs> and may do that. So before I invite Steve into communion, uh, I'll offer a little prayer so that it is me who is interrupted, but we can hear the things there. And it occurred to me whilst... Um, we were having our break, I selected at random five churches, just by sticking pins into the yearbook really, to offer prayer for. So I would like us to bear in mind, and while we pray for every single church in Wales, and indeed over the whole of uh, Britain and out into the world, I mention these five that I picked out with my random pin sticking, uh, the English Congregational Church in Carmarthen, All Nations Church in Swansea, Markham Congregational Church, Ton Pentra in Rhondda, and Ivor Dowlais. So can we pray for all our churches, but think of them especially? Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for that special communion, that communion that comes when we know that you are present, that communion that binds communities together, that encourages us if we feel discouraged and depressed and that strengthens us, waking us like the chime and call of your bells to the love of our wonderful Saviour. We ask your blessing on the churches in Carmarthen, All Nation Swansea, Markham, Ton Pentra and Ivor Dowlais, and all our churches, and pray that you will give to each the strength and the leadership that is needed for the facing of a new and different age. We ask this prayer in your holy name. Amen. Amen.
Uh, thank you. And the clock has struck, so uh, it will not interrupt anyone else. And I particularly didn't want it interrupting when we are actually at the communion table. And I would ask Steve now if he would bring us to that table. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, what a wonderful Father you are, what a wonderful God you are. We pray, Almighty Father, that you would help us as we prepare ourselves for coming to your holy table. Have mercy upon us, cleanse us, and forgive all our sins that we freely forgive all who have sinned against us. Assist us with your grace, Almighty Father, that we may set out this memorial to our Saviour's death with adoration and thanksgiving. Open our eyes to behold the vision of his love. And we pray, Lord, that by feeding on Christ in faith, we may be strengthened with might by your Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> We who truly and earnestly repent of our sins and are in love and charity with our neighbours and are resolved to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking from the, this time on in his holy ways, we draw near with faith and we take this sacrament to our comfort and growth in grace. And now that the table of the Lord is spread before us, let us lift up our minds and hearts above all faithless fears and cares, and let this bread and this wine be to us the witnesses and the signs of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Before the throne of the Heavenly Father and the cross of our Redeemer, let us consecrate our lives afresh to the Christian obedience and service. Let us pray for strength to do and to bear the holy will of God. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. He also said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish. But have everlasting life. The bread which we break is it not a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf. We who are many are one body. For we partake of the same loaf. And the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? And so, dear brothers and sisters, we come together and we hear the sacred words of the institution of the Lord's Supper. For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, also, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us eat the bread together. This is the body of Christ which was broken for you. This do in remembrance of him. This cup is the new covenant in the blood of Christ, which was shed for many under the remission of sins. We are invited to drink all.
Lord Jesus Christ. How we thank you for your continued presence and your love. You are the one who guides us. You are the one who upholds us. We thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice on the cross. And we thank you also for your wonderful resurrection to new life. And we pray, Almighty Father, for the church, for the world, for the whole of creation, To be renewed in your precious name. Yes, we are. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you, Matthew, for the music. Has Sarah got back in time to join us? Yo, in the house. Oh, lovely. <laughs> so I hope that the trip to the hospital went well. Yeah, all smooth, but we'll wait for the results for Chris. Well, thank we'll you. pray that they are good results, Sarah. And would you like to lead us now in prayer? Yes. So let us pray. 
Loving God, thank you for this gathering. We know we are spread across many different counties and countries. But you are our guiding light and you are the one who constantly asks us to gather together with one another and gather together in your holy name so that your name might be glorified, might be strengthened to our hearts and might give us the courage to tell others about the love that you have for us. We thank you so much for each and every one of the households and churches who are represented at this meeting today. We pray peace upon our places of worship and our homes. And we pray that the peace that you gave us in those post-resurrection times to your bewildered, frightening, frightened, but faithful followers, you said, peace be with you. So let us know your peace. We have taken the Lord's Supper together. We have prayed together. We have listened to music today. We have heard testimonies of different experiences of communion. Although I didn't hear Janet's address, I will look gladly forward to the recording. But we ask you to bless all those who have contributed today. And may it be a blessing to our ears as we have heard it, Lord, and a way to uphold our hearts in faith. And as we share the recording with our wider church network, may it be a blessing to them too. And loving God, we pray for all those churches who are part of our wider fellowship, particularly those in Wales. But we pray for the congregations that Janet and Suzanne attend to. We pray especially for the churches that, although were picked at random by Reverend Chris, we ask that you uphold them. For we are all bewildered, frightened and faithful followers in these post-lockdown days. We're reminded so much of the confusion that would have followed your resurrection, Lord. We know the truth. We believe the truth. But it is so awesome that you came back to us and that you promised us eternal life through your sacrifice and resurrection. So we ask that you keep drawing us to you, Lord. Keep drawing us closer. When we feel doubtful or frightened. When we feel bewildered or lost. When we feel joyful, challenged, happy, peaceful. Just keep finding us. Keep finding us and keep drawing us to you. For we know you as our master and our friend, our redeemer and our companion. And as we have shared the blood and the what blood and the bread together today, we know that we are true companions, even though we cannot meet in person, because we share bread with one another and we share bread with you in your memory. So keep feeding us, Lord. Keep spurring us on. For we want to do the things that we do in your name. To glorify you, but also to make the world a more peaceful and beautiful place that reflects the love that you have for us. So loving God, thank you for our gathering today. Thank you for the courage that you give us each day. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, for whom there are so many names, but we call you our saviour and our friend. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Sarah. And now, just before saying goodbye, could I ask our president, Steve, if he would conclude the service with the benediction? Shall we just pray? And now may the blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, rest and remain upon each and every one of us, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Steve. And now all, all that remains is to offer thanks, I think particularly to Matthew, for working all this technology and giving us so smooth a ride. Thank you to our speakers, to everyone who's taken part. And since the sun is still shining, may the Lord bless you through the rest of this day and indeed forever by keeping with us all in his presence. Thank you all and goodbye. Chris, could I just say a couple of things? Sorry. Oh, well, lovely to see you oh, there. I didn't know you were with us. Uh, as a finance meeting finished early, so I've been with you since you break. So I jumped on and you were all just going to break. It's good, so <laughs> good to see you all. It's so lovely to see you all this morning. I just wanted to uh, remind you about our National Assembly on Saturday, the 8th of May. The registration link is now available. You just need um, to follow it and just put your name and email address in. And we would love you to join us online. Um, between about half ten and about two o'clock on Saturday the 8th of May there'll be the usual reports there'll be um, the president's reflection and there'll be the accreditation celebrations in there as well so please share that with your fellowships as well and encourage as many people to um, engage with us online on that day it's obviously <laughs> the first time we've ever done it online um, and uh, we're looking forward to engaging in a new way with, with loads more people. And if you could gather even um, within church buildings, you could do that as well and show it online and encourage it. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to mention was about the Ministry and Mission Fund, because we've had a change nationally in that. And I to make churches as aware of it as I can. So previously, when any church donated to the Ministry and Mission Fund, we would split that automatically. So 60 would stay within the Congregational Federation for supporting churches and mission um, projects here. And 40% of that would be sent to CWM to support mission projects across the world. Now we're leaving that for churches to make their own um, decision of they'd like that money to be split so if you do make a donation to the ministry and mission fund please just state whether you would like it where it would like to go how you'd like that to be split between cwm or home fund or not split at all and um, so i just wanted to share that with you but it's so lovely to see you all and um share fellowship this morning through communion so moving thank you chris hi thank you Yvonne, and lovely to see you and to have you with us so uh we're grateful for that. And again, thanks to everyone and every blessing for the rest of today and tomorrow. Bye. 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 Thank you very much.